Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from Biden's tax proposals to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services leader. You can follow me on Twitter at Exporter Tax. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, I'm excited to be joined by Thomas Grodin. Thomas is an international tax partner in our New York City office and leads our international tax financial services practice here in the U.S. Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Doug, for having me. Um, I'm excited to make my uh, my my debut. Well, we're we're very excited to have you, and I I wanted to start before we do- dive into the the SPAC topic at hand with you're actually my fourth Brit on the podcast that coincidentally is also a partner here in the U.S. at PwC that specializes in U.S. taxation. Can you explain to our audience, how did you make your way from the University of Warwick over in the U.K. to, to PwC here in the U.S.? Sure, Doug. Um, so having graduated from Warwick back in 2000, a very long time ago, I joined uh, our U.K. firm. I'm not really sure what I wanted to do. Um, I was reading the uh, marketing material and I saw an acronym TLS. I didn't know what it stood for at the time. It turns out it was tax and legal services. So I had five years with the UK firm and enjoyed myself. And I was presented with an opportunity to come to the US for a year. And at the time I was told I was crazy. Um, The UK and US tax codes were so different. I'd be going back to square one. What was I thinking? Um, But I've always relished a challenge and I thought well let, let me give this uh, give this a try and uh, so I signed the one-year contract extended and, uh, and and the rest is now history and you you never left and you've been here ever since I've, never left. I've got um, a wife three kids and, uh, and a mortgage so I'm, I'm pretty handcuffed here now <laughs> Well, we're, we're happy to have you. So I, Thomas, I get a lot of questions on social media, particularly from people outside the U.S. who would like to become U.S. practitioners. What advice do you have for, for somebody who's, who has that interest or desire to kind of move from, from non-U.S. To, to, to inside the U.S. to become a tax professional? Yeah, well, what I would say, and I think actually this is more um, – pertinent in, in recent years, uh, given some of the OEC developments, is that a lot of the principles you may learn in your home jurisdiction are actually transferable. So any the intuition that you develop is generally a, a applicable over here, although the, the nomenclature, nomenclature can be very different. And so don't be um, uh, too uh, put off or too intimidated by the use of different uh, terminology, different words. Once you dig beneath the surface, there are actually more similarities. And um, the the direction of travel, hopefully, um, with, with what we're seeing at the OECD, is that, that there will be even greater international alignment. So perhaps easier to navigate now than it was back in 2005 when I when I came across. Yeah, it, it's a great observation. The harmonization of rules, particularly, you know, across the international space, we've seen a lot more during our careers, and I'm about the same vintage. And uh, yeah, that, that's been very fascinating. And as we've seen with ATAD and BEPS 1.0, obviously, and ATAD in Europe, and now with BEPS 2.0, you know, we're discussions about a minimum tax. We have spent plenty of time talking about that, but if that actually comes to fruition, but it's a great observation that a lot of very different tax systems for some of the develop, developed countries have certainly harmonized. So yeah. let's move to, to the topic at hand. And this is a topic that I'm, I'm really excited to have you on to, to learn more about, something I haven't spent a ton of time with um, in my personal practice. And I know this is something that you're knee deep in, and that is the special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs. Um, I, I know, Thomas, before we dive in, that uh, a international tax topic or something is really important or something that has really kind of crossed the, jumped over the just being interested in nerdy tax professionals to the client, to the, to people at large. When my mom, who is a retired educator, yeah. asks me a question about something. And so I, I think she had heard about SPACs or something on NPR or something that, that she listens to. And so when my mom asks me a question about international tax and I haven't had it on the cross-border tax talks, I was like, this is probably something we need to talk about yeah. if my mom is asking me a question. So 
So if you can answer to my mom, Thomas, what is a SPAC? What are these things? Why is everybody talking about them? And then we'll get into how they work and some of the tax consequences. Sure. Um, no, I, I, I fully concur there. It's, it's a very hot topic. You cannot, a day does not go by now where there isn't a headline in, in the mainstream media about a new SPAC being formed or a merger with a SPAC. So a SPAC is, as you said, a special purpose acquisition company. So essentially, it is a newly formed entity whose sole purpose is to go out and find a private company to acquire and, and effectively take public. And the way that it does that is that shortly after formation, the sponsor of a SPAC, and we'll get into who those uh, sponsors are, um, will raise money in the public markets through an IPO. And they're simply IPOing a, um, a shell entity. It has no operations, no assets. Um, and the business plan simply is to go and find a target. And typically, a SPAC will have two years under its constitutional documents to, to, to do that. Um, the, the other interesting thing about SPACs, uh, if you just look at the statistics, uh, and, and I can share some perspective as to why this perhaps is the case, but in 2020, when, when SPACs really you know, became prominent, half of the IPOs in the US were through SPACs. And, what 2020 was a was a record year 2021 we've already surpassed the volume of SPAC transactions in the market so there is a question um is this trend here to stay and uh, certainly we'll share some some predictions um but the other point to make is SPACs aren't new in fact they've been around since the 1990s um they've just gone in and out of of, of prominence in fact an, an interesting um fact for you um, they were actually around in the in the 1800s during the, uh, the South Sea bubble, as it was known then. And um, I've got an interesting uh, interesting quote um, that, that I that I read in the um, in the Financial Times this week, saying um, SPACs were essentially modern versions of the vehicle created back then. The purpose being to carry on an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody knows what it is now. South Sea bubble ended very badly. Hopefully, that's not going to be the case here. But uh, in, in all seriousness, no, SPAC, SPACs are very important uh, vehicles now because they allow private companies um, access to the public markets in a process that is slightly different uh, to a traditional IPO. And if you look back the past 10, 15 years, many businesses, particularly in the United States, have uh, chosen not to go public. They've relied on the private markets for, for various reasons. And a lot of those companies now are at a stage where um, they're either looking to, to grow or accelerate their, their growth strategy, their transformation strategy, or if we look back to 2020, um, during the pandemic, particularly early on, a lot of those businesses needed to shore up their balance sheets and the, the SPAC process was, was attractive for them to, to, to do that. Um, so in a nutshell, it, it's, a, it's a newly formed company that raises cash and uh, promises to its investors to find a suitable acquisition target, um, which it then takes public. All right. So let's unpack a couple of those. That's a great explanation. And, and want to maybe first start with, well, this seems a little odd um, that you're going to be, that uh, you'll set up a SPAC, um, then request money and to your point you know investment but you don't know what the actual target or what the investment is and so fundamentally this is really a bet that the investor is making on on those founders right on those initial right. investors and like so you're going to look at if an investor is doing some diligence on this presumably they're looking at what is the track record of those investors as opposed to like obviously in a traditional IPO you are going to know exactly what business you're going to be investing in and I think the other interesting thing is that this gives the access to investors much, yep. much more broad access, right? In other words, that I think in traditional IPOs, it's certain, you know, investors, large investors generally get kind of that first swipe, that first access to IPOs, where in a SPAC concept, those, you know, the investors, I think it's what, $10 a share or talk a little bit about that. Cause I also then want to talk about the founders, but you know, the, 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 how does somebody invest why does somebody invest what do they need to invest as part of forming this thing yeah so the SPAC phenomenon if we can call it that gives 
um, investors, particularly retail investors, an opportunity to invest in private equity like strategies, which they otherwise would not have access to. And to your point, often in a traditional IPO, the shares available are very restricted. Um, institutional investors are allocated them, but retail investors typically are not. So there, there's an access benefit there. And secondly, it enables investors to um, place faith, if you will, or back a management team. So maybe I can talk a little bit about the sponsor. And sponsors um, uh, in the past couple of years uh, in include investment professionals with very impressive and significant track records, investment professionals who work for well-known um, asset managers. And so they are giving um, a new group of investors the opportunity to um, benefit from their expertise and experience. Um, while we're talking about sponsors, Doug, and I know you are, you are a, a baseball aficionado, we're also seeing celebrity spats. So, uh, Billy Bean has one, for example, although a word of caution, and this is on the SEC website, that investment decisions shouldn't be backed solely on celebrity status. Um, hopefully that's obvious to everybody. But um, yeah, there are um, a wide range of sponsors who are putting their names to these vehicles. And really, um, they, they are placing their, they're putting their reputation on the line. And so they are incentivized to find a good deal um, in, in order to maintain that reputation. Yeah, I understand that both Steph Curry and Jay Z have their own specs as well, um, and that sounds like sound investment advice is not to rely solely on the celebrity investors. I I, I like that. So so talk to me a little bit about about those investors because I like to let's dive into a little bit of some of the the tax implications and and maybe we start with 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 the investors themselves before we even get to the formation and and some of those tax implications of the entity and choice of entity and choice of characterization um at least the way I was thinking about it from from the sponsors or, or founders and I've heard kind of people use different for different terminology but frankly the way I kind of thought about it was it, it seems to be very similar to, to maybe what I would consider a traditional carried interest in, in private equity. Yeah. And um, and then the investors are obviously more of that traditional in investment. And I think one of the things that we'll come to and one of the reasons that's important is that, you know, after some of the, after the investment, after the, the SPAC receives some of its investment, you can end up with significant built-in gain for those sponsors and need to be mindful yeah. as we're going through the process not to trigger some massive gain yeah. you know, prematurely. But talk a little bit about that kind of sponsor versus investor tax and some of the key tax implications with those. In, in, indeed. Uh, so perhaps we, we go through the life cycle. So the first step is for the sponsor to form the SPAC. And the way that works is, the sponsor will um, subscribe for shares in the SPAC itself, um, typically for nominal consideration. Um, a number that you often see is, is 25,000, which, which is paid for those shares. Um, but at that stage, and there, there's a question, are the shares at that point worth what you pay for them, 25,000? At that point in the life cycle, remember it's pre-IPO, pre-finding a target, there are significant contingencies in relation to how much those shares might ultimately be worth. And so a very reasonable position to take, and this is generally what you see in the market, is that um, those shares are worth what a sponsor will pay for them. But those shares um, have attached to them a couple of very important rights. One is that upon an IPO, those shares equate to approximately 20% of the public company. And you mentioned carried interest, and 20% is often a number that you see out there in, in, in carried interest structures. So there definitely is an analogy. Um, and then in order to further you know, safeguard the, 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 the tax position at the time the shares are issued, and the practical advice here is to issue them as soon as possible after formation, um, would be to make a uh, what we call an 83B election. And what that does, it's a reference to a section in the code, but it ensures that um, it essentially accelerates the realization event for income tax purposes and it um, removes any risks of forfeiture such that upon making that election whatever the value is that day relative to what you paid you pick up as income but then a benefit is that any future appreciation is eligible for capital gains treatment which will be important for the sponsors 
But then to your point, um, following the IPO, um, you have the founder shares and then you have the public shares. The founder shares convert to 20% of the company. And then you have a mix of investors, many of whom will be taxable US individuals, corporations, pension funds, plus you have the sponsors. And it's very important upon the, um, the merger or the, the combination, which we also call a de spacking So once the SPAC has found a target, it will then merge with that target. We want to affect that transaction in a, uh, in a tax-free basis as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, because to mm -hmm. your point, um, particularly for the founders, they will have very low basis in their shares, because it's a likely unrealized gain. And to trigger a gain at that point would be a very harsh outcome because there's no cash in the system to pay any associated tax. Right. Right. Phantom income, as we call it. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, just, a, 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 and perhaps we, we, we will get into this as well. I, I jumped straight to the, uh, the de spacking But before we get to the de spacking um, there are some important considerations in terms of the jurisdiction of the SPAC itself relative to the target. And there are some tax issues there that we need to navigate again in order to not trigger gain for either the sponsors or the investors. All right, so so let's dive into to that a bit because you had mentioned, Thomas, the, the key tax implications for the investors. And that, to your point, really kind of sets the tone and, and drives a lot of the strategy to continue to, to defer that you know potentially massive gain, particularly for for the sponsors, and then obviously for for the investors as well. Um, I do want to make sure because we're using a lot of nomenclature here that there is the formation of the SPAC, right, and then there is the IPO, and so the IPO really means when the the SPAC goes out and gets capital, right, and he actually gets the funding. Yeah. That is the IPO. But but Correct. from that point on, that then the investment vehicle just has a pile of money, right? And then it has what two years to be able to make a determination of what target it's going to acquire, right? Or targets. And if that does not happen within two years, my understanding is then that money has to be refunded. And then we can talk about what some of those tax implications are if there's no actual founding. And then the last piece of the puzzle, and again, we're going to unpack each of these and talk a little bit about the tax implications. But then the last piece of the puzzle, my understanding is, is what's referred to as despacking, which is the actual acquisition then of the target by the, right. the SPAC. I was a little confused as to why it's a D SPAC if the SPAC still is acquiring the target. Um, but do I do I generally have that correct as far as the, the process and, and the order of, of how the how it works? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And maybe two points to add is um, when the IPO happens, cash is raised. That cash is then placed in a trust and that cash can only be used for two things. One is um, to affect a business combination to acquire a company, or um, if a company has not been found within that two year period to fund shareholder redemptions. Um, so that, that, that is correct. So there are, there are some, so, share, so whilst the, the public investors are placing their faith with a sponsor, there is an opportunity to pull out uh, should they not like the target that has, that has been found. I see. So, so, and that's an important clarification because effectively the investors can get their money back either if they, you know, a target is not found within two years, but then there's also some protection, if you will, that if yeah. that investor doesn't ultimately agree with whatever that in investment decision is, that they have the right to be able to redeem out. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps one more feature to highlight, because you might ask yourself, well, as an investor, why would I park cash for two years? with a sponsor um, and potentially get no return and have that cash returned if I don't like the deal. So another feature to incentivize investors is the, the issuance of warrants simultaneously mm -hmm. with common shares. So the way the practice market practice uh, generally works is that when you subscribe for a unit in a SPAC, you will receive one common share and a fraction of a warrant. And the warrant is typically exercisable um, uh, to use the ten dollar uh, unit price again, market practice at eleven dollars fifty, and upon the IPO, the common shares and the warrants trade separately, and it is not unheard of. In fact, I see it quite frequently for certain investors to redeem out 
but keep the warrants. And that is the incentive or the kicker for early stage investors to, to back a management team. They can then trade the warrants. Got it. All right. So, so a number of kind of interesting tax issues that I want to unpack here. And um, the, the first is just the, the choice of investment vehicle. You know, whenever we're making decisions as, as tax professionals, you know, a couple of things come to mind, right? First is pass through versus corporate. And we generally with the, the US rules have the opportunity to make check the box elections and then foreign or domestic, right? Kind of those, those yep. two initial those really two initial threshold questions that we have to ask. What are, what do we think about when we're setting up a SPAC? Is it pass-through, is it corporate, and then foreign or domestic? Maybe we start with pass-through versus corporate. Sure. Um, actually, the a lot of the tax complexities associated with corporate status, which, which I'll come on to in a second, can be avoided by going with a flow-through. So, a a partnership, as you said, for US tax purposes, we can check the box. And if you take a partnership public, it becomes a publicly traded partnership, another term of art. Uh, and from a tax perspective, it's a great structure because it gives you maximum flexibility to buy either a, a US company or a foreign company without triggering some of the, the difficult outbound transfer rules we have. We'll, we'll get to those in a second. But a significant disadvantage with that structure is that the market and specifically the investors um, don't like partnerships. They don't like receiving K-1s and it has less market appeal. Uh, and in fact, that's why since tax reform in 2017, we've seen a number of well-known public companies that were partnerships um, convert to corporate status so that they could broaden their appeal. Um, so technically it's a good structure, but commercially much less attractive. Yeah, the, the, the tax guy in me says flow through, of yeah. course, right? Because then yeah. we, you can avoid what we're going to talk about, some of the anti-inversion 7874, three, as much as I enjoy getting into the mechanics and 367. Uh, obviously, there are still implications of 7874 with, with, with publicly traded partnerships as well, but certainly simplifies the analysis to a, to a certain level doing a partnership. But it's interesting on the commercial aspects of what you know what's going to drive investment because uh, we, as we like to say, we don't want the tax tail to wag the dog. So that is a, an important piece. So what about foreign or domestic? And I have a feeling, Thomas, you're going to tell me it's going to depend on the location of a target. Yeah. And obviously, with what we just described, by the nature of this investment vehicle, when we set up the, the SPAC and do the IPO, we don't know who the target is. So how do we make that determination of domestic versus foreign? Indeed. And as we know, Doug, best laid plans don't always materialize. And so if you had that crystal ball, it would be easy. If you knew you were going to uh, acquire a domestic company, you would set up the SPAC in the US and vice versa, foreign. And often it, it does work out like that. And if you start US by US, start foreign by foreign, um, relatively straightforward. Complexities arise, though, where you start US and you find a foreign target and, and vice versa. Perhaps I can just highlight a, a couple of the complexities that one would have to navigate. So perhaps if we start with the foreign example, and this is what I'm seeing more and more, and perhaps um, this is because the issues you have to navigate are a little easier than going in the other direction, US to foreign. But if you're a foreign SPAC, and, and the jurisdictions you typically see are Cayman, DVI, um, a tax benign environment, but you find a US target. Well. In that instance, um, the sponsor really, or the SPAC has no choice but to re-domesticate because if you don't do that, then simply that transaction, foreign SPAC buying US company, that is um, almost certainly going to be an inversion transaction. You mentioned 7874 with very negative consequences. And, and effectively that foreign entity, if you didn't re-domesticate would be treated as a de facto US taxpayer. And not only that, there can be negative consequences for the investors. For example, US investors would not be able to enjoy qualified dividend income treatment on any dividends. And based on the Delta as the code stands today, that, that is a significant uh, disadvantage. Um, so the foreign SPAC would redomesticate um, in a uh, in a tax, largely tax free transaction. Um, typically, we call we, we would look to do that under um, uh, Subchapter C and an F reorganization. Uh, 
Um, there are a, a couple of um, caveats to what I said about that being tax free. Um, if um, I'll get on to um, the, the PFIC issue, uh, which applies to foreign structures shortly, um, but there is a, a, a an outbound provision um, in, in 367, 367B, which effectively requires US shareholders upon a redomestication, an inbound redomestication, to recognize any earnings and profits at that point in time. However, the consequence should be relatively benign because remember, up until the, the business combination, the SPAC really doesn't earn any income. It may place the uh, cash proceeds from the IPO in an interest bearing account, but doesn't really have much, much income. Going in the, the other direction is a bit more tricky where you start out with a domestic SPAC with every intention of finding a domestic target, um, but then a foreign target comes along. And that, that poses a difficult challenge because your base case is that holding a foreign business or uh, foreign entities under the US is something we would rather avoid, even post TCGIA, uh, given the US rate and the guilty regime that we have. And if you look on the horizon, that's only gonna become more expensive, more, more punitive. So we would do all that we could to avoid having a US TOPCO, but there you then have to work through the anti-aversion rules, 7874. And there are two ways to potentially avoid having an inverted transaction. One is a counting mathematical exercise where you compare the percentage ownership of the SPAC shareholders or the former shareholders in the combined business. Um, and if you're below certain relative to the overall ownership, so for example, the target shareholders plus any other additional uh, capital that's been raised, if you're below um, certain thresholds and the magic number here is 60, um, then you can avoid potentially having an inversion transaction, although there are some exceptions to that if there have been uh, serial inversions you know, prior to this transaction. Um, but if you can't get there on the maths, then the other exception that you can look to satisfy is called the substantial business activities test. But this will require the foreign entity to have a, a, a minimum amount of its assets, revenue and employees in the foreign jurisdiction in question. And the threshold there is 25%, not necessarily an easy bar and, and, and very fact specific. And as I mentioned in my introduction, um, if you had a partnership, it may be easier to uh, avoid being in a situation where we, we wouldn't have a, a US top code. All right. And so I'm, I'm going to want to unpack a, a few of those because this is it's, it's really interesting. But my my first question and instincts would be, well, why wouldn't everybody then just set up as a foreign SPAC? Right. And then you could inbound. Yeah, you're going to have to your point, the 367 B all earnings and profits inclusion and think through those 367 consequences. But I think what you're going to tell me is while the investors are sitting on that money and if we've got a foreign corporation, we're going to have presumably a whole bunch of shareholders, nobody greater than 10% or maybe just a few with a 10%. So it's likely not a CFC, right? Because you have to have greater than 10% US shareholders or yeah. greater than 50%, which tells me you're going to be smack potentially in the PFIC rules. And so is that kind of like that you have to weigh, like how do you deal with, with if you're going to do a foreign company sitting on that cash waiting for a target, dealing with the PFIC issues versus a domestic? And then I guess obviously if you're planning on doing a domestic target you would set up a domestic company but for yeah. those that want the maximum amount of flexibility it would seem setting up a foreign investment vehicle would make the most sense but talk a little bit about the PFIC in, challenges indeed indeed Doug and unfortunately there's no panacea or nirvana here there is ultimately a trade-off so to your point why not just start off foreign and then you have flexibility well if you start off foreign you're gonna have to navigate the PFIC traps and if you think about what a SPAC is and what it does it sits on cash um, I mean that falls squarely within the spirit definition of the PFIC regime, which is anti-deferral regime. And generally owning stock at a PFIC is suboptimal because when you realize future returns, whether it's a distribution or a capital gain, not only are you subject to ordinary income tax rates, but you also can face an interest charge. So it's generally an outcome we, we would look to avoid. And I mentioned there are some, some techniques that can be applied to mitigate the consequences. So the first one would be to evaluate whether or not a foreign SPAC can meet a startup exception. But that's to a certain extent beyond your control because it depends on 
when a deal is found and we mentioned the two year period sometimes that can be extended by an additional year and if you're going to rely on the startup exception the way that that works is that in the year that you have gross income which can include interest income if you place the cash in an interest bearing account by the way some do choose to put it in non-interest bearing to delay that first year you effectively have two years after that first year to come out of peak status may, may or may not happen um and so what i generally advise my clients to do is in light of that risk make an affirmative election a so-called qualifying elective fund election whereby each year you pick up any income and really there isn't generally that much income to pick up and actually if you factor in expenses there may even be a loss you don't get to pick up the loss but at least you don't have an income inclusion but to make that election you need cooperation from the underlying SPAC and the sponsor they will need to provide you with a PFIC statement but that would be the safest course of action but there is a quirky issue to highlight um, in relation to the warrants and so um, and I didn't know this until I, I started, started you know practicing more in this area but seemingly Doug um, and, and this is what going back to your question at the beginning differences between the UK and the US um, this is unheard of in, in other tax systems, but apparently there were regulations proposed in 1992 in relation to PFEX that still have yet to be finalized. And what those regulations do is they cause options to acquire stocks or warrants to be treated as if you own the stock. So you think, okay, well, why don't I make a QEF election? Well, the problem is we had regulations go final in December of last year that preclude you from making craft elections in relation to warrants. So you're caught between a rock and a hard place. And if you're unable to make that election and we have the DSPAC and, and the company does really well, technically the stock which those warrants uh, relate to or, or were converted into could be subject to this tape. Now I do know that there are tax practitioners out there who believe that because the regs have been out there for so long, there is a very reasonable tax position to take that they do not apply. But it is nevertheless a wrinkle and a marketing deterrent. And if you read any um, S4 prospectus, you will see this highlighted as a risk factor. 7874 rules, it, it does call into question of whether now they just go way further than what they otherwise should or were intended to do. Because these types of transactions that you described really don't seem to me to be what the intention of 7874 was when we're effectively dealing with a with an investment vehicle that's looking for, for an investment or has just in, it hasn't even acquired that investment yet. I, I, I fully agree. And actually, what I didn't mention is if you successively navigate 7874, you then have 367 to deal with, which 367A, which can call, cause gain recognition if you're transferring outbound. Right. And that was going to be where the kind of the last technical piece, and then I want to move to kind of future of, of, of SPACs and the key takeaways. So you have to navigate the PFIC issues. You need to navigate the tax at the investment issue at the investment vehicle or the investors. And then to that point, like if you're going from domestic to foreign or, or, or foreign to domestic, you had mentioned the 367 rules, right? If, if we're going from foreign to domestic, you've got the all EMP inclusion. If you're going from domestic to foreign, you need to think about 367A. And to your point, making sure sure that those sponsors or founders, because they have such significant built-in gain, you do not want to, to, to risk you know, tripping a, a 367 inclusion before the investments even happened. Indeed. Indeed. So, I mean, I feel like we could make this a, a three hour podcast. I'm little, you know, uh, this particularly getting into some of the 7874 uh, intricacies, but we'll, we'll spare our listeners from that. Um, Thomas, maybe can you talk about what are the future of SPACs? I'm fascinated to learn, given the, the history uh, of these and how long they've been around, given how much everybody's talking about them, you know, as of 2020 and 2021. Uh, but what are, you, what are the future of these? Is this a trend that we're going to see? And what are some of the key takeaways for our listeners? Yeah, well, I don't think they're going away anytime soon, given the record amounts of capital that SPACs have raised. So over the next two years, we are going to see a large volume of transactions and actually a statistic I, I just saw uh, Q1 of 21 was uh, broke, broke records in terms of overall deal activity in the US I think it was north of a trillion and of those transactions 25% were conducted through SPACs and as I said not a day goes by we don't see another SPAC so they're here at least for the next couple of years 
I actually think perhaps unlike the past where they came in and out, we saw them pre-financial crisis, and then they went quiet. I think given the um, types of sponsors we are now seeing, so very well-known investment firms, management teams with high pedigree, lots of experience, I think the product itself is going to remain attractive for, for investors. Um, and given the retail um, demand that we're seeing out there and the more sophisticated retail investors, um, I, I, I think that SPACs will be, will be around perhaps not quite as hot as they currently are. Um, and another reason we're seeing so many is just because of the um, valuations seen in the public markets right now. It's a, it's a prime time to, to be raising capital. But I don't think they're going away anytime soon. What I would also say is that the SEC has taken a keen interest in the product itself just to make sure that investors are sufficiently protected. But as I was describing earlier, there are some safeguards built in to allow investors to pull their cash if they're not comfortable um, with, with the underlying target that's been found. And then I think the other point I would note is that the deal itself is evolving. And so a recent SPAC that I saw, um, the sponsor decided not to, to take a promote or a founder share, the, the, the 20% stake, but instead um, issued warrants that are only exercisable um, three years following the DSPAC to greater align interest between the sponsor and the ultimate investors. So I think the product itself will evolve, um, but I think it's here for some time to come and, and the tax issues that we just discussed are, are not going away. If anything, they, they will be exacerbated. Yeah, I, I think that's an important takeaway from a tax perspective, Thomas, is that, you know, as, as much as I would like to see the 7874 regulations kind of skinny down or frankly more more appropriately targeted, because I certainly understand the policy r rationale for, for, for 7874, uh, but but trying to skin down some of this collateral, what I would view as collateral damage from, yeah. from the these these new regulations, I, I just really don't see that anytime in the near future. But uh, um, time time will tell. And it's really just important for investors, uh, stakeholders in these to understand the, the wrinkles from an international tax perspective and some of the potential pitfalls that that they they may run into as they're structuring these deals and uh, and despacking and actually acquiring these uh, these targets. So Thomas, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you to Thomas Gronin, PwC's ITS Financial Services Leader. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.